This Alternative Views program was recorded in 1988, but the establishment media didn't have this story until 91. It's almost the crime of the century that Bush's true past has not come out. The man is so thoroughly tainted with so many different scandals and, uh, and uh, world-scale world scale wrongdoing that it's mind-boggling that he's still standing. The um, Reagan-Bush campaign went in and uh, uh, intervened in negotiations that Carter was having with the Iranians, which is a treasonable offense, and uh, arranged that the hostages be kept until after the election. Not merely until after the election, but until the precise moment that uh, Jimmy, that Ronald Reagan was being inaugurated. We had the Watergate story in, 19, in the summer of 1972. I worked on a magazine called Sundance Magazine, and uh, a report, we had a reporter named Jeff Gerth who's a, uh, uh, an investigator for the New York Times now, and he had the Watergate story covered left, right, center, up, down. We had uh, Nixon mapped to all the burglars, to Meyer Lansky, to uh, every connection you could ever imagine to the, organized to, the, to the Kennedy assassination, the whole bit. We gave the story to George McGovern. I know he read it. He wouldn't touch it. Uh, you know, and then, then two years later, of course, only about a tenth of what really was involved with Watergate ever came out, but that was enough. You know, I think if a hundredth of what George Bush has been doing uh, ever came out, that uh, the guy would be shot into space, basically. <laughs> but, uh, uh... One of the biggest news stories in American history is being suppressed by the establishment media. We'll discuss this right now on Alternative Views. Back in 1987, the alternative press began covering the October surprise story, an extremely important story, but the establishment media did not talk about it until 1991. The following program is one of several on alternative views. One of the main things we enjoy doing on alternative views and have for, well, since October of 1978, is to bring you people who are experts in their field, particularly those who have written in books or in authored a lot of uh, articles in generally the alternative press but sometimes the traditional trust press and we present them to you so you can see what's really happening in the world these people generally don't get on the regular media we have such a person this evening with us on alternative views Harvey Wasserman is a journalist an author of three books a co-author of another he is also an ecology activist well, Harvey's also written for the establishment press, people like the New York Times, the Boston Globe, uh, the LA Times, and he's written for the alternative press, the people we present to you uh, almost weekly in alternative views, the Progressive Magazine, Mother Jones, The Nation. Matter of fact, we have presented some of the material that, off, that uh, Harvey has written. So, but he's with us today, and we're going to cover a lot of subjects on our program or a series of programs. The focus of this program with Harvey Wasserman is the October surprise story and the lack of coverage by the regular media. But before we talk with Harvey Wasserman, let's have a couple of news stories or so from the alternative press. Well, there are all kinds of different ways of looking at things, particularly statistics. And one of the things the Reagan administration came out with recently say, hey, isn't it wonderful? The proportion of Americans living in poverty dropped in 1987 from 13.6 to 13.5. Isn't that great? And they say that the income of the typical average American family edged up 1% in 1987. Now that 1%, they said the average American family earns $30,853 a year. 
How many of us, how many of you make three thirty thousand a year? Of course now, they're talking about families. So that means that probably most of these families have two incomes. So in order to make that fancy salary, which is typical, it takes more than one breadwinner. However, the Reagan administration is crowing about this, but then this appeared in the news section of the Washington Post, but then the Washington Post uh, editorial page said, well, the un unemployment rate is down, the real median family and per capita income both are up, and yet the poverty rate remain essentially unchanged. This current business expansion, as they call it, is more than five years old, and 32.5 million people continue to live below the poverty line. And if you're aware of the poverty line, poverty is a hell of a lot above the poverty line. But for one reason of this, you know, the Reagan administration crows about how they have created more and more jobs. What they don't say is that these are in the service sector where the income is considerably less than before. That's one reason why income is down. For instance, Reuters has a, uh, an article here that says industries with growing employment paid an average of $21,000, almost $22,000 a year, but this is $10,400 a year less than the industries where jobs were lost from the period from 1981 through 1987, as the United States has deindustrialized itself, moved the industry overseas. So on top of this, we have the union-busting activities which have been going on under Reagan for so many years, in which the, the unions not only have been losing in salary, but they've come up with these two-tiered salary contracts where the old workers, people stand in side by side, one making $15 an hour and the other making $5.50 an hour. So it's an incredible drop in income, which will become progressively worse as the years go by. Frank, uh, George Bush in his um, campaign inauguration speech in New Orleans uh, referred to all the jobs that were created in the Reagan administration and the average $22,000 a year that, that Reuters report seemed to confirm. Well, I read an analysis of this in the uh, New Republic that said that uh, both Bush and the Reuters facts were highly uh, skewed, that uh -huh. it's only in certain sectors of the economy do the jobs uh, average 22,000, uh, and that's less than half of the actual jobs that have been uh, created. The same article pointed out that although uh, something like uh, two million um, uh, jobs a month uh, have been created during the Reagan administration that are, as you pointed out, mostly lower paying uh, service uh, sector jobs, during the Carter administration, 2.8 million jobs were created per month. So the fact is that the economy has simply been expanding as the population expands, as uh, more people are uh, on the labor force, they get one kind of job or the other. So it's no big deal that the Reagan administration has created all of these uh, jobs. It's simply a nat natural function of the um, economy that even during uh, Carter's administration where it was alleged that there was high unemployment, et cetera, more jobs were created then. Than under Reagan. Well, we've talked many times about how Reagan administration has been monkeying with the statistics on uh, unemployment, and that unemployment is considerably higher than what the Reagan administration has been saying. There was an article in the September 16th issue of the Texas Observer by George Williams, who's a professor at Rice University. He talks about the other America, and he puts, he looks at these statistics on income and poverty in a longer period of time than just comparing them to the previous year, as the Reagan administration does. He says 20% of American children under 16 live below the poverty level, and that's an increase of over one-third over the pre-Reagan decade. One-half of America's black children, one-third of the Hispanic children, and one-sixth of the white children live below the poverty line. And these numbers have been increasing since Reagan came to power. 41 million American children are so poor they must be sustained by government food programs just to stay alive. And we know that Reagan has cut those. Among developing nations, the United States ranks 19th in infant mortality rate with 40,000 infant deaths annually, and half of them resulting from conditions associated with poverty. Poverty level has increased 
people living below it has increased 13 percent under Reagan. Well, these statistics go on and on, but I'm sure you see what the point is, that the people in poverty, the people who are suffering, have increased under Reagan in spite of the fact that the wealthy have been done, doing very, very well. The wealthiest 20 percent, as Professor Williams points out, of America's families receive more than 40 percent of the total national income, and the poorest 20 percent receive 4 percent of that income. And only 8 percent of America's families own outright about 26 percent of America's privately held tangible assets. And they control an estimated 70 percent, that's 8 percent, controls an estimated 70 percent of all private assets in the United States. The and this is the worst since the 1920s. In other words, the Reagan, the Reagan revolution has done this just that, only it's a counter-revolution. You know, it's very interesting. Back when I was in high school and college, they'd always say, well, there are basically three types of liber uh, people, uh, political attitudes. There are the liberals who want to make changes. Then there are conservatives who want to keep the things the way they are. And then there are the reactionaries, and they want to go back and do away with all the things that have been built up in the present and go back to an earlier age. And so this term reactionary was used a lot, and it was, you know, a bad, bad name. Nobody wanted to be in a reactionary. This was a label that was penned on Goldwater, and one of the things, you know, contributing his demise, I'm sure, but they never say anything about Reagan being a reactionary, do they? And yet Reagan is exactly a uh, revolutionary reactionary. A new yeah. uh, category has to come in for uh, him. <laughs> in fact, the greatest distribution of wealth in American history took place under Ronald uh, Reagan. Literally billions of dollars were redistributed from the poor and the middle classes to the rich through Reagan's uh, tax bank program, his building up the arms industry, his government subsidized subsidies for different uh, corporations, et cetera, making class divisions much uh, greater under the Reagan administration than previously had ever happened in recent American uh, history. This really blows away the theory that liberals were advancing, that we're moving towards a classless society <laughs> in which class divisions between the rich and the poor are uh, disappearing in the uh, United States, at least during the Reagan administration. The uh, class differences have spectacularly uh, grown, as has the growth of a new underclass. I mean, there's even a worse situation than uh, poor working uh, people, and that is all the homeless, all of the uh, underclass that doesn't have any job, home, or even hope of any employment uh, whatsoever that has, again, mushroomed spectacularly under the Reagan administration, has visitors to any city in the United States can see. The Covert Action Information Bulletin, November 30th, is one that focuses a great deal primarily on Israel and what has happened there in the past, uh, what is happening now. For a real understanding of the Palestinian situation, this issue of Covert Action Information Bulletin is a must. But it also has very comprehensive information about the war in Afghanistan. And it shows how the U.S. for years would try to undermine the regime in Afghanistan after the uh, communist regime, a rather uh, mild and uh, reformist regime, took over and overthrew the, the one which had been previously supported by the Soviet Union. See, for years the Soviets had supported these real backward repressive governments in Afghanistan because they were non-aligned and they were in any trouble. But some homegrown communists who decided, hey, we want to modernize our country, we want to, to clear out the dope narcotics dealers, we want to have uh, education for our people, we want to free women from slavery and all. Well, they got together and they overthrew the government. But then the, uh, there was a coup within the coup and a real repressive bastard took over and he started forcing all these reforms on, and on the people who weren't ready for it. And so the moderates uh, either were killed by this Amin or they fled to the Soviet Union. So the people were up in arms about this uh, repressive uh, communist dictator that had come in there and tried to force all these re reforms on them. But in the meanwhile, the U.S. was immediately undermining the uh, new uh, revolutionary regime before Amin took over. And they also started funneling funds to various uh, 
opposition groups. Well, this, as we know, is went into full-scale operation, and if we thought that and it became the largest U.S. operation since the Vietnam War and the most costly, billions and billions of dollars went down that rat hole, much of it going unaccountably to some of the big narcotics uh, dealers uh, from these various tribal groups, a lot of the money and weapons going to uh, Islamic fundamentalists who are as bad as anything you would find in Iran or Lebanon. Uh, these various opposition groups hate each other, and even if the Soviets pull out, there's going to be a bloodbath even among the people who are fighting against the Soviet-backed regime. But what is key to this is that for many years, the Soviets have tried to get peace in the area and come up with a broad-based government that would uh, be pleasing to all, to the most, if not all, the various groups, and so that there would not be this bloodbath that has occurred. But every time the Soviets would uh, get together with the, uh, with the Pakistanis or with other groups, the U.S. would come in and torpedo these various talks. So they kept it going on purpose. There was, a matter of fact, a, there was a um, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, they came up with a secret uh, State Department uh, document which said, we're doing this on purpose. We're going to make this as prolonged as possible and as bloody as possible to show the people in the third world, all over the, all over the world, that uh, if they have any ideas about overthrowing the status quo or questioning U.S. hegemony anywhere, then this is what's going to happen. They're going to have continuous, horrible bloodshed. And this was, <laughs> the State Department administered it. But also in this, it ties into this uh, story which we had on the Polisario guerrillas, where the U.S. and the Moroccans and the um, Saudis were involved. The U.S. funneled a lot of the uh, money and the equipment through the Saudis, through the Pakistanis, through the Egyptians, and also through right-wing American organizations like the World Anti-Communist League. Uh, in this uh, the series of articles, I can't go into them, it's just too long and too complex, but it also talks about the Afghani Contra lobby here in the United States and how the uh, CIA set up propaganda organizations to pump out information in support of the Afghani uh, rebels that would get into the U.S. press. So that was what you saw. You didn't see any of this other information about how uh, so much of this, uh, much of the aid went directly to the narcotics lords in Afghanistan and Pakistan and how this uh, um, trade is mushrooming and so most of the opium, most of the heroin coming into the United States now comes in from uh, the U.S. Uh, clients and supporters on the Afghani war. Hmm. It's horrible, horrible. And that's a story that just hadn't been uh, reported at all. That's Not in the least. Out. All you hear is about those wonderful Afghani freedom fighters. Oh. Dan Rather has gone over there a couple times and you see him in a helmet up with the Afghan <laughs> yeah. uh, rebels as if he's joined uh, some liberation front. We'll have more news later, but now let's have our interview with Harvey Wasserman. Harvey's an historian, journalist, business executive, has been on a lot of the big name talk shows. He's also taught history and journalism in college. He's author of four books, including America Born and Reborn and Harvey Wasserman's History of the United States. He's written for the Establishment Press as well as the Alternative Press. Let's talk about something which is going on right now, and that is the election between Bush and Dukakis. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me from the outset when the Republicans George, uh, chose Bush that, good Lord, if there's anybody who was ever vulnerable to attack, it was George Bush from so many fields, but we don't see it. Uh, can you tick off some of these things that the Democrats could uh, pin on George Bush? It's, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think it's almost the crime of the century that Bush's true past does not come out. The man is so thoroughly tainted with so many different scandals and... Uh, and uh, world, scale, world scale wrongdoing, that it's mind-boggling that he's still standing, uh, let alone uh, uh, on his way to the White House. Um, Bush 
in 1980s, I know many people watching uh, uh, know, was involved with perhaps the most uh, heinous and uh, cynical manipulation of American electoral politics uh, on record, which is the uh, October surprise scenario. In, uh, in 1980, there were 50-some hostages being held in Tehran by the Ayatollah. And uh, Carter was in the White House, and all the polls showed that <clears throat> if Carter got the, the, the uh, hostages out within two weeks of the election, that he would win re-election. And that if uh, they didn't get out, that uh, his general impotence would uh, reflect badly and that, the, and that Reagan would win. Mm -hmm. And uh, in early October, I, I remember this specifically, and um, it's been widely reported, uh, Carter's dealings with the Iranians seemed to be bearing fruit. And it appeared that uh, a deal was going to be struck and that the, Iranian, uh, that the hostages were going to get out and that Carter would probably win the election. But suddenly the uh, negotiations broke down and the hostages did not get out. And um, uh, in fact, they were released, uh, as you'll rem well remember, precisely as Ronald Reagan was taking the oath of office. Right. Now, <clears throat> that seemed uh, awfully, to me and my paranoia, that seemed hey, wait a minute. Well, then soon thereafter, <laughs> Soon thereafter, um, the Reagan administration started sending large quantities of arms to Tehran by way of Israel. And uh, it's known that the first shipments began as early as March of 1981. Uh, one of the planes crashed um, on its way from Tel Aviv to Tehran in the summer of 1981. And the contents of the, uh, of the, the, the plane were confirmed to be uh, uh, arms uh, from from the U.S. and of course the Israelis could never have shipped any arms to Tehran without the approval of the Reagan administration. So, what happened? You have three basic elements here, and the, the, you know I've been working for months to get the major media to take this story and deal with it in a big way, and all the electronic journalists know about it, all the print journalists know about it. It's no secret, except to the American public as a whole. Even the New York Times, which is supposed to be the <coughs> newspaper of yeah. record in the United yeah. States, hasn't touched it. No. And yet this is something which water gates like, uh, you know, a lot, lot like yeah. a mosquito bite, you know, stinging an elephant's butt. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing compared to this. This is a, a a pre-coup, in a way. Well, it's actually a tree. It's actually a capital offense. I mean, I'm a, I'm an <laughs> opponent of uh, capital punishment, but I suppose in this case, I could be persuaded to make an exception. <laughs> um, what what it boils down to is this. You know, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, this guy Brennicky and Rupp in Colorado, who allegedly f were involved in flying Bush over there to make the. Um, uh, deal, and then there was uh, uh, Bonnie Sadr, the president who was president of Iran at the time, who made the initial accusation in the media that this had happened. Um, and all the uh, guys, are, the media people are saying, well, there's no smoking gun. And, you know, just like there was no smoking gun with uh, whether Reagan knew or not that the profits from the Iranian arms deal were going to uh, feed the Contras, well, it doesn't matter if there was a smoking gun or not. You have a basic situation here. There are only three, of, in which there are only three scenarios explaining why the hostages uh, did not get out uh, after Carter got the deal going, uh, why they were then released precisely as Reagan was being inaugurated, and then why American arms started going to Iran. Now, the first uh, explanation we had uh, from uh, that illustrious uh, uh, liberal George Will uh, <laughs> was uh, that the reason the uh, hostages were let out when Reagan was being nominated was because uh, Reagan threatened to nuke them with, you know, drop nuclear weapons. Oh well, you know, this is ridiculous. The, the Iranians never would have taken a threat like that seriously. And uh, certainly we wouldn't have started been sending them guns uh, after uh, Reagan's inauguration if we had just threatened to, to drop nuclear weapons on them. Second explanation was that the Iranians hated Jimmy Carter so much they wanted to do anything they could to hurt him. Well, if they hated him that much, why were they negotiating with him in the first place? And the Iranians may be driven by many emotions, but they were involved in a war at the time with Iraq, and these hostages were c clearly legal tender, I mean, or illegal tender. I mean, they were worth quite a bit. And uh, uh, the Iranians never would have just thrown them away in an empty gesture. Uh, they, they would have gotten something in exchange. So really, uh, logically, looking at the bigger picture, <clears throat> the only explanation that makes any sense at all is that the uh, Reagan-Bush campaign went in 
and uh, uh, intervened in negotiations that Carter was having with the Iranians, which is a treasonable offense, and uh, arranged that the hostages be kept until after the election. Not merely until after the election, but until the precise moment that, uh, Jimmy, that Ronald Reagan was being inaugurated. And Bonnie Sauter, who was president of Iran at the time, has said that he felt the reason that they did that was so that it would give a boost to the uh, Reagan revolution when uh, Re Reagan came into power. Now, there was, it's well known there was an October Surprise Committee in the Reagan-Bush campaign apparatus. It was headed by Richard Allen. Allen's boss, who was running the campaign, was William Casey, who became head of the CIA. And it doesn't take any great genius to understand that uh, these people were capable of this kind of deal, particularly when we find out later that uh, the Contras have been uh, nose-deep in dealing drugs all these years. And uh, 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 Bush was head of the CIA when Orlando Atelier was murdered in downtown Washington. Um, this kind of stuff uh, these people were quite capable of. The biggest mystery to me at this point is why the Dukakis campaign uh, steered away from the story altogether. It's also curious to me with the media because Jimmy Carter was on Larry King's show. Did you see that yes. on CNN? Yes, I didn't see it, but I read the transcripts. And yeah. Carter said that... He knew well, about it. The Carter said that, well, he <laughs> said that basically he was willing to tell what he knew about it if Dukakis would ask him, and Dukakis never asked him. But he acknowledged that he was aware that it was going on when he was still in office. Yeah, he had, he had heard rumors. And that he, but, but, you know, there's a difference, seems to be a different standard of proof here. I mean, uh, you know, they hounded Gary Hart into oblivion uh, for being, having his picture taken with Donna Rice. I mean, uh, according to this standard of proof, they would have had, the, uh, you know, the media has not even put the story out. Uh, the electronic media, uh, but they were certainly willing to put the story out about Gary Hart. Now, what was the smoking gun in that situation? I mean, did they have action? <laughs> you would think that they would have needed an action video of the Gary and Donna going at it in order to break the story. Or dripping, he, dripping gun instead yeah. of smoking gun. Maybe. Well, you said that. <laughs> I mean. uh, but in, in this case, you know, uh, I've talked to producers at CBS and all the other networks, and they simply would not go with the story. They even have, there's even a guy in, uh, in Colorado named Brennecke who has testified uh, to a court, to a federal court, mm -hmm. that he has evidence that Bush uh, himself flew to Paris to make this deal. And um, uh, the media still won't deal with it. Now, one interesting thing is that a lawsuit has been filed on behalf of 13 of the actual hostages who were held in Tehran at the time, charging, now they've been suing all along, um, ever since they got out for very compensation. But now they're charging that they're actually charging the Reagan Bush campaign with having deliberately detained them longer than necessary in order to win the election. It would be very interesting to see. I, I don't have much uh, faith in the legal system in terms of getting this story further down the pike. <clears throat> but I will say this that, um, you know, we're talking just prior to the election. If Bush does win, um, uh, which looks like it's a likelihood now, although less likely than the media has been willing to, has been putting out. Um, but if we have a President Bush, uh, hard to even say that, uh, uh, and the economy does go down, I think that you'll have enough anger out there that some of this stuff will come out. Now, but uh, I have been d deeply impressed by the ability of the Reagan people to k suppress major news stories, even when there are congressional hearings going on. You know, yeah. the media has stopped covering mm -hmm. congressional hearings. Before Reagan came in, it was standard that there would be segments on the evening news about the various congressional hearings going on. That has disappeared in the age of Reagan. And um, uh, uh, there has been a decision made that instead of covering uh, congressional hearings, uh, the, you know, basic trivia will find its way onto the, na I mean, you know, the national news is just, is hardly even a cut above the local ambulance chasing uh, uh, man bites dog stories you, see, you hear on the local news. Well, it's worse than, uh, I mean, that that's better. At least that is, has some relation with reality. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. On the, on the uh, media, on the TV networks particularly, we just see the disinformation of the Reagan administration night after night after yeah, night. Yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, uh, 
But they, they uh, throughout those whole months of the Iran-Contra hearings, they never, ever got to discuss the, the fact that the Contras are drug dealers. And it was, the only person that mentioned it, ironically, was Orrin Hatch, the right-wing senator from Utah, who basically, with Ali North up there, said, uh, you know, oh, oh gracious, exalted patriot, uh, <laughs> we've heard these ugly rumors about the Contras dealing drugs. They're not true, are they? And Ali said no, and that was the end of it. Um, but, you know, months of hearings go by and nobody brings up the idea, the fact, that the Contras are drug dealers. So it's a similar situation with the October surprise. I've been pushing this, I, I've been pushing the story for months. Basically, since I'm a writer, I, I do try and get op-eds published. I would send the op-ed to, I sent the op-ed that I wrote to some papers in Miami, and they told me, oh, that's old news. <laughs> it had been covered to a certain extent in the Miami Herald. In Herald. Miami Herald, yes, they've been done. I sent the same op-ed to the guy in the Minneapolis paper, and he had never heard the story at all. And um, uh, I had a similar mixed response all over the country. Now, I did have the op-ed uh, uh, that I wrote published in the Los Angeles Herald Examiner the morning of the second debate when Dukakis was asked that important presidential question what he would do if his wife was raped and murdered. Uh, this has quite a bear bearing on how one conducts the office of the presidency. But, uh, and he, he, nobody brought it up. It was in the, the LA Herald Examiner is the second biggest paper in LA. Uh, it was right there on the op-ed page that morning. The entire American media was in LA and nobody asked the question. And Dukakis, I, I have to place a tremendous amount of blame on Dukakis himself. I mean, you do uh, uh, nominate a candidate precisely to bring these things up. And uh, this guy, uh, for whatever uh, reason that I cannot imagine, uh, decided that he was, I, he was not going to deal with this stuff at all. I mean, the closest he got was to Noriega, yeah. uh, to discuss Noriega. And Noriega is the, barely the tip of the iceberg of what, what this, these Bush people have been willing to do. Well, also the fact that uh, somebody was telling me the other day that they know somebody who worked in the White House or close there. And they said that Bush's office is right, actually right next door to Oliver North's office. Oh, they love Oliver. I mean, right right down there. And so as a result, it was so easy for Donald Gregg to, to supervise the running of the narcotics trade sure. out well, of see, the there, vice president's office. Can you imagine that? But it, seems, it makes sense. You know, they, uh, they, um, uh, black activists have always talked to the federal government. The, the right wing has always wanted drugs in the ghettos. Mm. I mean, they, they, they want these people, they want the underclass drugged out. Um, the, exi the emergence of crack is, is no um, coincidence in this, in this time. I mean, the great social legacy of the Reagan administration is a permanent underclass that's drugged out, uh, uneducated, uh, homeless, and hopeless. And uh, uh, that, they want the creation of that. So you have this amazing uh, hypocrisy going on of these people talking about suppressing the drug trade and at the same time promoting it because they don't want these people voting, they don't want them active, they don't want them reading and, and, and getting politically involved. And, and it's, it's, you know, George Orwell talked about the same kind of stuff. He, Marx talked about it in a way, you know, religion is the opiate of the people. Now opium is the opiate of the people. I mean, that's the bottom line here. Opium is the religion of some people. Right? In a certain sense, and it's government promoted. And the, the astounding thing is that they've been able to get away with it. Now, uh, you know, there is an undercurrent out there. Not, uh, people do know about this October surprise. No one I've ever talked you, you, uh, there's a fair amount of knowledge about it. No one I've ever mentioned it to, the, the scenario to, has doubted that it could have happened. And uh, uh, sooner or later, I do believe it'll come out. The question is, in what form and what impact will it have? And that, I think, is going to depend, I hate to say it, on the economy. If the economy goes down, people get really angry, all this stuff will come out. But uh, I'm not wishing for it to come that way. I wish we had a strong enough, pure dem democratic uh, urge that it would just come out on its own. You know, there's another story which uh Dukakis has never come out with and mentioned, and that was the famous interview which George Bush had with the L.A. Times back in 1980, in which he said, oh, yeah, we could have World War III. Yeah. Survivability. That's right. We said, Survivability of yeah. command and control was, uh, was Bush's... Uh, yeah, we'd have our natural resources, we'd have survivability of command and control, meaning the people in the power structure who runs things. We'd lose 50 million people, but heck, we could <laughs> inflict more uh, damage on the Russians than they could on us. Yeah. And yet... Nothing is said whatsoever about that. No, hasn't been brought up at all, and uh, it will be brought up, uh, I think, over time. But 
with the American public's really been let down by the uh, Democratic nominee. I mean, uh, uh, Dukakis won the nomination basically because he had the best fundraisers, and uh, that speaks very ill for the for the process as a whole. Uh, and it's just going to have to be shows like this and people just banging away at wherever we can to get the stuff out. And uh, sooner or later, you have to hope it'll come out. Now, and you know, if people have any doubt at all about the, the gravity of this, uh, I, I, I recommend they think back to the Lusitania. Uh, the Lusitania was a British um, luxury liner, and I talk about it in my book, uh, Harvey Wasserman's History of the U.S., which covers 1860 to 1920. And uh, uh, the American public really did not want the U.S. to go into World War I. It was very unpopular. Uh, but in 1915, the Germans sank a luxury liner. Uh, was a British ship going from the U.S. from New York to London, and was carrying all these passengers, including 120 Americans. And at the time, Grit Britain and, and Germany were at war with each other. And one of the rules of war was that you were allowed to sink ships that were carrying weapons. And that was just basically a rule of the game. So the, the Germans sunk the Lusitania, and they claimed that it was full of weapons. And the British said there were no weapons. And 120 Americans died. And Woodrow Wilson seized on this as a big, you know, thing for beating the, the Germans and this tremendous racist outbreak came. Uh, everybody hated the Germans except the German Americans and the radical labor movement, which smelled something smelled fishy to them. And they did not want because they knew if we got into World War One that there would be tremendous repression and a, 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 a great um, a skewing of interest in, in the issues at home, which were economic democracy and control of the factories and redistribution of wealth as opposed to going into a war. So, uh, uh, but Wilson, of course, used this, and the people got into the preparedness movement and started building weapons. And then in 1916, Wilson ran as a peace candidate. In 1917, he got us into the war. Sounds and, like LBJ. Uh, sounds like LBJ. Sounds, sounds doesn't familiar, it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it was all based. A lot of it was based on the emotional response to the 120 Americans who died in the Lusitania. Well, earlier this decade, with all the advances in undersea technology, guess what happened? A submarine, a deep sea submarine, got down to the Lusitania. Guess what they found on the Lusitania? Tons of weapons that were being actually being shipped from the U.S. to Great Britain. The United States got involved in World War I on the basis of a complete lie, and it's it's indisputable. So you know when people ever say, well, I had one news person actually say that she just couldn't believe that people would be so cynical as to arrange a deal to keep hostages in, uh, in Iran longer so that they could win an election. Well, it's happened. It's happened before. We had the Watergate story in, 19, in the summer of 1972. I worked on a magazine called Sundance Magazine. And uh, a report, we had a reporter named Jeff Gerth who's a, uh, uh, an investigator for the New York Times now, and he had the Watergate story covered left, right, center, up, down. We had uh, Nixon mapped to all the burglars, to Meyer Lansky, to uh, every connection you could ever imagine to the, organized to, the, to the Kennedy assassination, the whole bit. We gave the story to George McGovern. I know he read it. He wouldn't touch it. Uh, you know, and then, then two years later, of course, only about a tenth of what really was involved with Watergate ever came out, but that was enough. You know, I think if a hundredth of what George Bush has been doing uh, ever came out, that uh, the guy would be shot into space, basically. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that's just going to depend on us uh, banging away at it and, and keeping, it, uh, keeping it happening. There's a good book out uh, by Mark Hertzgard, a friend of mine, called On Bended Knee, about how Reagan has, has manipulated the media. And uh, it's, you know, it's an infuriating story. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the economic change and the structure of the media over the past eight years, where um, uh, you know, the news centers have basically been converted into profit centers, and their, their performance is judged not on how they cover the news, which they actually used to be, but uh, on their ratings. And uh, I mean, that's why you get millions of dollars going into these pretty faces to sit in front of the TVs. To the, in front of the cameras to read uh, nonsense, basically, which passes as news. And uh, the, cover, the quality of coverage has deteriorated enormously uh, under Reagan and uh, will probably continue to as long as, uh, uh, as the TVs or um, stations are controlled like, by corporations like General Electric, which owns uh, NBC. And of course, very shortly after General Electric to took over NBC, you suddenly had a documentary about how wonderful the nuclear power program uh -huh. is in France.
France uh, and uh, capital cities owning uh, uh, ABC and, and uh, uh, Lawrence Tisch controlling CBS. I mean, it's all just big money and it's all basically uh, aimed at ratings and uh, the ratings tend to aim for the lowest, lowest common denominator. So you really, uh, uh, the quality, and the, these news reporters are much more interested in their careers than, um, uh, uh, than covering the news. You know, um, they'd all like to win a Pulitzer Prize here and there, so every once in a while you get something breaking through the woodwork like these stories on the weapons facilities, which my co-author Bob Alvarez has been pushing for years, and <laughs> you'll get a reporter at a place like the Times is really willing to push it. But um, something like the October Surprise, which has enormous implications, they won't touch. You have to remember that uh, the Watergate story really only broke because of two guys and one editor who were willing to stick with it. And there were plenty of, you watch All the President's Men, which is probably a reasonable, or read the book, a uh, reasonable uh, uh, facsimile of what went on. We were very close to not getting that story at all. And uh, not only were we close to not getting the story, but we might never have heard about it had not, with all due respect, uh, Walter Cronkite come out and given it some play on the evening news. I mean, it's no longer enough for a story to just break in the papers. It has to be covered. The October That's surprise right. story has been raised, and it's actually been dealt with uh, fairly thoroughly uh, in the LA Times and in the Boston Globe um, and in some other media, media around the country, print media. But the, pr the reason it hasn't uh, really become a major issue is because the nightly news won't, won't put it on. And they really, uh, you know, it's, it shouldn't be determined do we have absolute proof or not if it's going to go on there. It's something, it's a story that should be put in front of the, major, the American public to discuss. Is it true? Is it not true? Uh, but the allegations that have been made have been so thoroughly documented b uh, beyond at least uh, reasonable credibility that uh, it should be discussed. The same with the uh, contra drug dealings. Um, but you have to fault the Democrats in the long run. I mean, it is the function of an opposition party to bring this stuff up. And if the Democrats had brought it up, the media would have covered it, I, in all fairness to the, to the media. It was, and and, and um, there's no excuse. They'd have and we can forced. never, uh, either, we, either we never nominate another guy like Dukakis, or we start a third party that's going to deal with this stuff properly. But uh, it, it's, it, ultimately, it, it really is the Democrats' responsibility to have brought this stuff up. And they had plenty of chances in the congressional hearings. Uh, I mean, the, Daniel Inouye was the chairman of those hearings. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, of course, now there is a... John Kerry's uh, committees have been dealing, to a certain extent, right. with the, tr the contra duck dealings, and they right. have not gotten the coverage. Mm -hmm. But once again, uh, the Dukakis campaign had the opportunity and could have brought it up. Well, even Jesse Jackson didn't... Uh, yeah, well, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, um, so, you know, it makes our job all the tougher frankly. Uh, I mean, you ultimately hope these guys will hang themselves, but we waited eight years for Reagan to hang himself, and um, I guess there was nothing from the neck up to hang is the problem. <laughs> but, um, what can you do? I mean, uh, you know, just got to keep at it. Well, it means there's more, uh, greater room for alternative views in the, in the media around the country. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, more necessary than ever. The, the one saving grace, I think, of the Reagan era, and it's probably a, uh, a symptom, uh, although a positive symptom, of the problems with the mainstream media, is the rise of talk radio. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, a number of the newspaper uh, coverage uh, some of the newspaper coverage about the October surprise specifically cited the uh, proliferation of the story on talk radio. And, um, uh, you know, I hope uh, that is one area of, of, of um, mass access media that we, people really have to be very aware of and, uh, and to use because people do listen mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they do participate and it's it, there's nothing better uh, in addition to talking to on a show like this to be able to sit in a radio station and get phone calls and, and go back and forth and know that a lot of people are listening. Uh, it's very important that that, that that medium be protected. And I would like to say that uh, the great danger in the coming years is not so much, I mean, I think uh, uh, we do have a lot of danger at the Supreme Court there, but I think that the way the First Amendment will really be assaulted is through libel suits. What, what's happening is that um, people are finding any excuse to sue for uh, both newspapers and individuals for saying certain things, and the courts are not being uh, quick in throwing these suits out. 
and that really basically curtails people's willingness to speak. I know we had this occur in Massachusetts. Um, there's a, uh, been a uh, referendum question to shut two nuclear plants there. And the people uh, promoting the referendum made a uh, commercial with a woman whose daughter was stricken with leukemia at birth. Uh, living right near the plant, and very clearly, um, you know, it's a symptom of radiation uh, uh, sickness. And this poor baby has gone through three years of her whole life in chemotherapy, and you know, it's just a total nightmare. And uh, they made a commercial about it, and they were they were uh, uh, allocated time for uh, under the fairness doctrine, what's left of it, to put it on TV. And the um, uh, Boston Edisons threatened to sue the TV stations if they ran this commercial. I mean, this poor baby's bald. I mean, you can imagine. And uh, the um, the TV stations caved right in and refused to run the commercial. Oh, and uh, so, you know, that kind of stuff is going to go on more and more. If you can get a cold of a copy of it, we'll put it on. Uh, okay. Seems to me we've seen a trend here with the media that the more and more control is required on the American people and the more and more nefarious activities which the government and the uh, people who control the government get into, that there's more and more suppression of information and of course we also know that they have laws in the books where they can have a military fascist dictatorship overnight mm -hmm. with the FEMA thing. Yeah. Is this an accurate reading? Of well, yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Fourth World Wilderness Congress that met in Colorado, and uh, there were some very well-known figures, including David Rockefeller there, oh, our old friends, and one of the speakers, and they were discussing the um, uh, formation of the World Conservation Bank. Now, this bank uh, briefly described what it's all about. Uh, first of all, they're planning on collateralizing 30 percent of the Earth's land surface. And all of this uh, being done under the mantle of protecting the wilderness areas of the world, <laughs> uh, the fragile ecologies of uh, South America and the Amazon Basin. Well, the World Conservation Bank, as planned, would contain trillions of dollars in capitalization, the collateral being d derived from receipt of wilderness properties throughout the world. Now, where are they going to get these wilderness properties? There are a number of third world countries that are very, very deeply in debt, including, of course, Mexico, Brazil, Venezuela, Chile, Argentina, uh, to name a few. The idea is the bankers go to these countries and say, we'll forgive your debt. We're going to forgive the interest payments. You're not going to have that hanging over uh, any longer. We'll even make new loans so that you can develop your countries. And all you have to do to accomplish this is you sign over your wilderness areas, and we guarantee you that we're going to protect those wilderness areas. We're not going to let these multinational companies come in. <laughs> they are and, the multinational <laughs> Yes, yeah, they are, and defile your wilderness areas. But you sign them over to us in perpetuity, of course, mm -hmm. and then we'll forgive your debt. And forgiving their debt won't cost the bankers anything. They just make a few computer entries and um, change the accounts. So the world... Well, the third, third world folks, they, uh, they buy in this, they think it's wonderful. I guess that's they still hanging. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are some of them in this article which... Uh, uh, this appeared in the bulletin from the Committee to Restore the Constitution. Some of them are not buying it. But uh, it seems to be, for some of them, the only way out. Because, oh. as you know, uh, the United States, uh, with the Federal Reserve and the Department of the Treasury, are actually uh, loaning the money to some of these countries now to pay the interest on their national debt. And it's like, uh, for instance, you and I going down to our banker and say, I don't have the money this month to make my car payment. Would you loan me some more so I can make that payment? And, of course, the uh, end of that road is plain. So that's what is happening. And for some of these countries, it appears it could be, uh, or it might seem to them to be the only way out of the predicament that they're in from their uh, tremendous debt burden. Well, now this is amazing, amazing thing because what it really means is that these banks will be able to take over the land in these countries. The land will no longer belong to the countries but to these big um, big banks and multinational concerns. And when you add that 
to the debt for equity trade, which they agenda up to try to um, give the banks something for the money they've been loaning to the third world countries, meaning that the, uh, instead of paying off the loans, that the uh, banks will be able to get stock positions, own stock in local companies. So in one way, in what you're talking about, they'll be able to come over and take over the land and in this other way, there are the banks and all be are coming in and taking over the local businesses. So they'll just be com taking over these countries completely. Well, and when you look at, we have a map here that would not show up well on camera, but it shows the areas that are being targeted as being the most likely to be involved in the designated wilderness lands. Most of them are, of course, in Africa. And it looks like Africa is going to be about half gone. South America, vast areas there as well. Of course, some big ones over in Asia, as well as... They even uh, have the Soviet Canada. Union targeted, don't they? They have a number of areas <laughs> inside the Soviet Union. And there's barely a temple in the United States. Somewhere up there, it looks like in the northern Rocky Mountains, right. they're going to protect something. <laughs> what guarantees are they giving that they will indeed preserve this land as wilderness? That is, they won't use it for development or profit or whatever. Because they're doing that in the uh, Amazon. Well, it occurs to me that the guarantee that they're going to give to these people is going to be the same guarantee that the central bank gave the United States, the Congress, that it was going to protect the U.S. dollar. Uh -huh. When we passed the Federal Reserve Act, I say we, when they sneaked it through, right. back in 1913, they also said that they were going to protect the American farmer. And uh, by the way, you may have noticed that they saved up, what was it, 60,000 foreclosure notices that they didn't mail out until after the election was over, election and then right. all of these go, go out. We're losing an average of 6,000 farms a month uh, over the last you know, few years. And currently, uh, this is a, as a, another point uh, that we might consider, is that according to the Department of Agriculture figures that I have, currently about 25% of the food and fiber in this country is being produced by mega farms, super farms, corporate owned farms and that this figure is projected out about uh, 10 years from now that 75 percent of the food, and far, uh, the food and fiber in this country will be being produced by corporate farms rather than by family farms in this country. And it looks like uh, much the same situation may befall uh, South America, Africa, other parts of the world if they fall for this trick and turn over these areas. Well, let's look at it from another aspect of another third world country, that uh, being the, the largest third world country, the United States. Um, if they can do this to the other countries of the world, we're talking about the biggest debtor nation in the world. If the United States can't pay its debt to the foreign countries and to the big banks, were they going to have this same type of thing uh, let loose on the United States, take over great areas of the United States? You Do you suppose they might repossess America? Is that <laughs> <laughs> what we're seeing happening? I saw a recent survey that was done by the Los Angeles Times that 70% of the commercial real estate in downtown Los Angeles is owned by foreign interests. Uh, the figure in Houston, a little closer to home, mm -hmm. is now approaching 40% of the commercial property. What you have here is a situation where uh, because of our trade imbalance and because about 40% now of our national debt is being bought by foreign interest, what are these people going to do sitting here holding these dollars that as they're actually holding them, day by day those dollars are losing their value so they have no incentive to hold those dollars. They can no longer, of course, redeem them for gold or silver, so what are they going to do? Well, let's go buy some vast tracts of farmland. Let's buy American corporations. That's exactly what we're seeing. And I saw an interesting figure that if all of the foreign-owned farmland in the United States were lumped together right now, it would exceed the size of the state of Colorado. It's a pretty good-sized farm. Amazing. What a strange, strange world we're going into and up to the year 2000. <laughs> The first time that somebody a few years, several years ago, told me about the Shroud of Turin, I thought they were putting me on. It was a Catholic friend of mine said, yes, there was the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ and all these uh, called the Shroud of Turin and it's uh, been looked at by scientists over the years and they say definitely it is the burial shroud that Jesus Christ was in and not only that, the medical experts who looked at it showed that 
It, not, it wasn't the physical damage that caused Jesus to die on the cross. It was he died of a broken heart. Well, I can't say that was convincing scientific evidence to me. But anyway, a lot of people believed it over the years. But then, uh, uh, oh, a few weeks back, scientists at Oxford University determined that the Shroud of Turin, said to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, is a fake. It only took how many <laughs> hundreds of years for them to come out with that? They said that the diocarbon dating tests of the shroud proved that it was made about 1350 A.D. So they said, yes, it does bear the image of a bearded, crucified man, but that's as far as it goes. But that ties in with this hysteria that took place in Lubbock, and where best could hysteria take place but in Lubbock, about people gathering, and they looked in the clouds, and by gosh, there are Jesus and Mary and a bunch of other stuff people were seeing. So now they say it's, uh, it's done great for... Uh, the tourism in Lubbock, and, uh, but now the Vatican, of course, that has its own rules for determining whether this is really a miracle or not. And so we've got to look closely at this before we can see if we can uh, determine if uh, what happened at Lubbock was really a miracle. Well, here are the guidelines. Uh, this was in the uh, Dallas Morning News. It says, those reporting the apparitions are psychologically balanced and of good moral character. Now, how could they be psychologically balanced if they see something like that? But anyway, also, the messages from Mary are in accordance with church doctrine. Hmm. So that you couldn't have an apparition of Mary saying, hey, you go out and smoke some dope, you know. It'd be Mary, all right, but it couldn't be good moral doctrine. Another uh, guideline, part of the guidelines, there is no evidence that reports are made for material gain. No, the Chamber of Commerce wouldn't say, hey, come up and see the place where the folks see all that uh, stuff. And there's no evidence of collective hysteria. Hmm. And the spiritual fruits of the messages are healthy. Oh, well, yes, sir. Well, maybe for Lubbock, it would be. Who knows? Hmm. Sounds to me like some hippies put some LSD in the uh, water supply of uh, Lubbock, and some of the town residents had some weird hallucinations. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. Glad you could be with us. Harvey Wasserman's History of the United States is published by Aqua Books, P.O. Box 23310, Columbus, Ohio, 43223. Fascinating book. We'd like to thank our director, Brian Lynch, our camera people, Duke Bay Olegban, Wayne Williams and John Cohn. Our technical director was David Ferrer. This was for our interview with Harvey Wasserman. For our news segment, our camera person was Eric Eubank, and the audio was performed by Kevin L. West. And we'd like to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV, for the use of their equipment. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. We get letters and postcards from people all around the country where alternative views are shown. It's a very positive response. We enjoy communicating with those people who watch views. the program. So if you'd like to contact us, here's our address. Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, 20 Austin, seconds. Texas, 78713. 15 seconds. 10, 9, Goodbye. Eight, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.